All right, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ariel Rivers, NACD's Pacific Region Representative, and I will facilitate this one hour NACD Urban and Community Conservation Webinar. Thank you for joining us to learn about Ohio's Warren County Solar Pollinator Habitat Discovery Trail. We will record this webinar and post on NACD's website along with a PDF of the presentation for future access. Please share widely with your networks and anyone who may be interested in seeing this or previous presentations. Please keep yourself muted for the duration of today's presentation. After the presentations, we will have a question and answer session. Please type your questions in the chat box and I'll read them out loud so that we can capture them for the recording. And we'll address as many as we can in the time that we have. Now, Ron Rohal will provide a few introductory comments. Ron is chair of NACD's Urban and Community Resource Policy Group, which is part of our National Resources Policy Committee. Ron. Hey, thank you, Ariel. And I welcome all of you to the monthly Urban and Community Conservation Webinars offered by the National Association of Conservation Districts through the support of our sole sponsor, the Scotts Miracle Grill Company. These sessions are designed by NACD's Urban and Community Resource Policy Group, a subcommittee of district officials and partners charged with guiding the association's services and support for districts work in developed and developing areas. Our goal through these webinars is to help districts share what they are doing nationwide and enable them to learn from each other and various agencies and organizations. And we appreciate the support of the Scotch Miracle Grow Foundation for making them possible. I invite you to let us know what you think about each webinar and what other topics you would like us to cover by contacting NACD staffer, Ariel Rivers. And please tell your NACD leadership what type of assistance you would like from your National Association for your Urban and Community Conservation Work. And now I'll hand it over to Ariel for the introduction of our speakers. Thank you, Ariel. Thanks. Thank you, Ron. <clears throat> Today we have two speakers. We will learn from uh, Shannon Russell Pennington, the Warren County Park District Staff Naturalist. Shannon is a graduate of Miami University and is an Ohio Certified Volunteer Naturalist, as well as a Certified Project Wild and Project Learning Tree Instructor. Named as WC SWCD's 2020 Educator of the Year, Shannon's passions include rehabilitating wildlife, growing native plants, and sharing her passion for the natural world with the general public. We'll also hear from Melissa Prophet, Warren County SWCD Education and Communications Specialist. Melissa earned her BA in Zoology from, and MA in Biology from Miami University with a focus on conservation education. Her master thesis incorporated entertainment and theatrical elements into education programming to increase engagement and re retention of information. Before joining Warren County SWCD in 2017, she was a wildlife educator for a local museum and presented programs for classrooms and family groups. Melissa is passionate about working with all age groups and conducts classroom programs, community workshops, scout programs, and public events. As a workshop facilitator for Project Wild, Aquatic Wild, Growing Up Wild, and Curious Kids, Melissa also collaborates with and provides a professional development to other local educators around Warren County. So thank you both for your presentations today. And with that, I'll hand it over to you to share your screen and start your presentation. All right, excellent. Well, thank you. We are both very excited to be here. So let, give me just a moment. I'm going to get a PowerPoint pulled up here. All right. Well, hi guys. So we are excited to be here today um, to share with you um, information about the Solar Pollinator Habitat Discovery Trail um, that went in at Armco Park um, here in Warren County, which is part of the Warren County Park District. So when we kind of think about, you know, why solar and pollinators? All of us are in that, that conservation world and environmental education world. And with sustainability, it's a multi-pronged challenge. Um, and I actually want to turn it over to Shannon at this time to kind of give you guys some background about Armco Park, where this um, installation is, and kind of what started this project to begin with. So Shannon? All right, good evening, everyone. Um, as Melissa mentioned, my name is Shannon Pennington and I'm the staff naturalist with the Warren County Park District. And I've been with the park for about five years now. And when I first came on board, they were just talking about potentially putting in a solar array. And we've been, this has been sort of brewing in the background for about 10 years before I joined. 
And it started to sort of take off when I got there, um, just coincidentally. And I met with a gentleman, Jim Yaki from Rocknell Energy, who was going to be installing the solar panels. And I found out that he is a beekeeper and he's really into conservation. So we sort of struck up a conversation because the area where the solar panels now are takes up about an acre and a half of park property. And that space used to be just a fallow field with a bluebird trail winding through it um, and lots of native pollinator plants. And it just had been allowed to kind of go wild on its own. And the original plan was going to be to put in the solar panels and put turf grass or gravel underneath there. And we kind of combined our, uh, our backgrounds and our knowledge and decided that rather than doing that, we would um, try and find a way to keep the native plants and kind of have a combined effort, a multi-pronged approach, as Melissa said, and have the solar energy powering the park, as well as keeping and enhancing um, the habitat that we had there already. So this image here is showing you guys kind of where the, the solar array is located in the park. Um, it's near where the there is a, a boating area there. There is a lake here in Armco Park. Um, so this was the area when the panels went in. Um, and I, I love this project because it is kind of that collaborative effort of finding people who have similar passions and saying, OK, how do we make this work? Um, so March of 2019 is when these solar panels came online um, and they are supplying power to different amenities in the park. Um, the, the clubhouses, the ball fields, the irrigation, um, the sprinkler systems, it's all being powered by this array here. And then it was, you know, taking that extra step of saying, how does this area stay viable and how does it still stay enjoyable for the families and the folks that are coming to the park. So um, the Rocknell Energy, they actually worked with uh, another partner that was part of this Ohio Pollinator Habitat Initiative, um, OPHI. Um, and this is actually a nonprofit group that is a lot of different agencies working together. Um, those of you who are watching, you know, that are based here in Ohio or along the Eastern Coast, you might be familiar with them. Um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, Ohio Division of Wildlife, Pheasants Forever, several different agencies are part of this OPHI and several SWCDs are as well. Um, so Shannon, I know that you guys work together on the, the seeds for the pollinator mixes and things like that. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, so we had uh, one of their wildlife biologists come out and do some soil samples and a site survey to kind of get in a get a better idea of um, the location that we were talking about and the kind of overview um, of what we were looking looking at and trying to, to kind of fix. And so they were able to design for us um, a seed packet that was species specific to our location that works really well in Southwest Ohio and the soils that we had to work with. And we also um, kind of had a, a double, double thing going on because if you saw from the picture, the solar panels are surrounded by a fence to kind of protect the public and to protect the, the solar panels. And because of that, um, the inside stuff inside the fence had to be limited to a certain growth height. So the seeds that were planted inside of the fence can only get to be three feet tall so that they don't obstruct the, um, the shading on the panels. But that the things outside of the fence, we're able to be um, a little bit freer with. So we have some woodier objects in there too. Uh, so it was, it was really nice to work with them because it was very um, specifically designed for our location. And we knew that we would have their guidance in installation and upkeep on it too. So they provided us with an entire plan, including um, when we needed to mow in order to maximize our um, pollinator visitors. So we weren't interrupting their life cycle and um, kind of a an, an, uh, plan for sustained maintenance too. So, you know, once these kind of were in place, uh, then the thought turned to, well, how does the community enjoy this resource? And how do we use this resource um, to promote environmental education about the pollinators and the renewable energy in the solar array? 
Um, this is where I really kind of became more involved in this project. Um, uh, another lady who is not here with us um, uh, named Diana Keneally. Um, she was a fabulous resource, is still a fabulous resource. She is actually the president of the Friends of the Warren County Park District, which is a volunteer group that supports the, the park district. Um, and she was also a graduate student at this time. Um, and so she was really instrumental in putting together a grant in order for us to pursue some educational elements to include with the pollinator habitat. Um, so we actually uh, were granted an Ohio Environmental Education Fund grant in order to establish a discovery trail that would wind around the, the array and move through the pollinator habitat in order to, to instruct people about what was going on on this plot of land. Um, so the discovery trail, it features seven learning stations with interactive signs. And so the funds were used in order to produce the, the signage and to establish this interactive trail that folks that come out to the park can enjoy. Um, so, you know, we, we put this all together um, and then we, the multiple people, you know, kind of worked to say, okay, well, what is it that we want the public to know? So we started to design and, and write the content for these interactive signs. So this is a map of where that signage is located um, around the solar array. Um, so there, there's a nice parking um, lot here. And then the trail winds you through the pollinator habitat and around that array. Um, and then up here, the first sign that we have is the, the welcome kiosk. Um, and so this kind of tells you, you know, I mean, OK, here you are at the beginning of the trail. It includes the map that you guys are seeing on the, the slide so that folks have an idea, you know, of where they're going to be going. Um, this isn't a big, long, heavy hike, so it is truly accessible to everyone, which is nice. It, it's a flat area. Um, the, the trail is maintained by the park staff. You know, it's wide enough that that, you know, even people with maybe uh, mobility issues can still go out and enjoy this resource. And the, the first in kiosk. Sorry, this was important to us because um, right next to the park is Otterbein Retirement Community. And that community was involved in purchasing the park. Um, it used to be owned by Armco Steel. And then when they went to go sell it, it was a combined effort from the county commissioners and Otterbein Retirement Community. So we wanted to make sure that we were including all of their, um, their residents um, that they would be able to utilize this facility. And there's actually a path that leads from Otterbein directly to the array so they can enjoy enjoy it throughout the different seasons. And this kiosk, when you first come in on the front is what you are seeing here, um, kind of the overview of, of the project. But on the back side of that kiosk is seasonal information that we change out depending on what's growing in that area at that time, things that individuals can look for, specific uh, wildflowers that they can look for with their kids or with their, with their grandparents and anybody in between. Yeah, so, so this is kind of where you begin, and, and it's great that it's able to be updated. And so, you know, as new things maybe bloom or if new pollinators are cited, you know, Shannon's great about getting that information on the kiosk sign and people are then aware of what to look for when they're visiting here. But then we also like, okay, well, what is it that we want people to know? Um, so, you know, kind of, we definitely want people to know that pollinators are necessary for life, you know, why do we care about pollinators? So the, the first station sign is, is going into, you know, what role do pollinators play in the environment? Um, what is pollination? How is that helping, you know, us when it comes to food production? Um, it talks about, you know, well, what are the different species that serve as pollinators? Some species are kind of well known where others, you know, kind of wasps and flies, and they're maybe overlooked a little bit when we think about pollinators. Um, and then adding an interactive component. Um, so on this sign, the, the four smaller squares that you see, um, the, the green and the yellow and the, the red squares, there are actually flip ups um, that you guys will see. I'll have a video um, to show you guys how those signage actually works. Um, and it's just kind of fun, you know, guess, okay, what food is pollinated by which pollinator? And then the second station, we want people to then say, okay, great, pollinators are important. We know a little bit more about them. 
what steps can we take at home if we want to encourage pollinators to come onto our property? Because not only is this, you know, serving as a place for people to come and enjoy, but we want them to take something away with them as well that can help spread these conservation practices even farther beyond just the, the Discovery Trail habitat. So this is talking about some great tips of what people can do in their own backyards to help support these pollinator uh, populations. Um, and then we do focus on one of those, you know, charismatic umbrella species, the, the monarchs. Um, the Great Monarch Migration Station is, is really important because it also kind of uh, is very synergistic to other programs that we do. Um, you know, several SWCDs, um, Warren County included, work with the OPHI, um, the organization that helped with the seed mix, in doing a milkweed collection every year. So in October, um, you know, we're kind of encouraging folks to bring in milkweed seed pods because they support monarch butterflies. Um, and Shannon does some fabulous monarch programs as well. Yeah, so I, I was sort of the, the go-to for this sign because a lot of my uh, fall programs focus on taking uh, caterpillars, monarch caterpillars into classrooms and allowing children to see the whole process of a caterpillar turning into a chrysalis, turning into a butterfly, and then what happens to that particular species over the winter and how they migrate down to Mexico for the winter and take this magnificent migration over 2,000 miles to get where they're going. And it's, it's a great opportunity for teachers and scout leaders and just everyday normal people um, to take something like that and be able to connect it to other things that they're learning in the classroom. So um, you might be able to see in the kind of grayish brown square there, there's somebody holding a butterfly. Those are actually my fingers. And on that butterfly is a little sticker. And that's one of the citizen science um, projects that we participate in at the park district is we work um, with monarchwatch.org to help um, help them track the butterflies and, and keep track of their migration because the monarchs are a really good uh, indicator species. People feel connected to them. Everybody knows what a monarch butterfly looks like. If you're um, in your 40s and beyond, you might have remembered that when we were little, they were way more prominent than they are now. So people have seen with their own eyes that they've gone on decline. And we've been able to see that this has um, continued across all pollinator species. So just having this one connection where people are like, aha, I know what this one is, um, was kind of our idea to sort of pull them in with the rest of the stuff. And then of course, a sign about solar power and pollinator habitat. You know, that's kind of the, the big draw of this particular location. Um, so we have a signage talking about, you know, why those work really well together um, in hopes that other areas, you know, can look at this example and, and maybe adopt a, a similar idea for their area, because it is such a, a great way to encourage the use of that renewable energy source and keep that area still so, so viable um, for our pollinator species. So, the last two of our stations actually then deal directly with the solar array. Um, so we talk about, you know, this conversion of sunlight to energy. Um, and then how does that greener energy affect our air quality? Um, and in these signs, you know, we, we drew a lot of information um, from Rocknell that in, installed the, the solar rays. You know, they were a great source of information for us. Um, and then also, you know, we have, you can see that there's QR codes here on the signs because we wanted to be able to update information as well down the road. Um, even though the sign itself is, is, you know, is static, we wanted current information to be available to those who are visiting the park. Um, and, and one of these things actually even draws kind of, you know, just on our own experiences. You know, we are trying to incorporate conservation lifestyles at home. Um, and one thing that I do is that I choose my electric provider at home so that, you know, I don't have solar panels on my home, but I use an electric provider that is using um, solar and wind energy. Um, and that's something that a lot of residents here in Ohio don't realize is that Ohio is what we call a free choice state and we choose our electric um, providers, regardless of what utility company is servicing your place of residence. 
And so that was information that we included here on the sign in the QR code as well, is taking people to that website um, that talks about from the state of Ohio, how we can make a choice in who our electric provider is. So again, it's that take home message. What else can you do when you leave you know, the, the solar array and the discovery trail? So we were really excited. We got these signs out and we we're like, okay, we're ready to bring folks in and we're gonna do all this programming and we're gonna have school groups out. And then- And then um, COVID hit, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, everyone who's been living well on the planet for the last couple of years knows that there was a lot of disruptions to the way that we were able to bring environmental education and conservation practices to our communities. Um, so COVID really, you know, made us kind of rethink some of the things that we had going. Um, as part of our OEEF grant through Ohio EPA, um, you know, we had certain programs and projects that we had written into the grant to, to show how this was going to be a resource to the community. And, you know, and several of those things included things like school field trips, um, professional workshops for local educators. Um, and due to, you know, in 2020, we did um, request an extension on that grant due to changes, um, and we were granted that extension. However, we didn't just want to wait because this resource is here. People could still go out and see it, right? Um, they could still come out with their families, and it's actually it was a great resource during COVID because it's outside. You could you could have space um, and still learn these valuable things. So it was like, okay, well, how do we get people to know about it? Um, so. It was great because uh, we were able to connect with the, the local media um, and actually get it on the news. Um, and if you give me a moment, I'm going to, so there is a short news segment that I would like to share with you guys. So I'm actually going to switch my screens for just a moment. And I'm also going to share my sound as I have learned how to do this. Okay, so that is still clicked. For something to do with your kids outside, a unique trail in Warren County is now. That's right, and this isn't your typical walking or hiking trail. As Ashley Smith explains, you'll come away with a new appreciation for the sun, bees, and even weeds. While this may just look like a field of some really pretty flowers and maybe even some weeds to you, it's actually very important for pollinators all across the region. And here at Armco Park in Warren County, you can learn all about these species and solar energy. The Solar Pollinator Habitat Discovery Trail is now open at Armco Park in Warren County. It's a one and a half acre section of the park used for solar panels and plants that pollinators use for food. Taking energy from the sun, turning it into power, which powers our park and a little bit of the park across the street actually. And then we have our solar pollinator area. So we're taking energy from the sun and helping native plants grow and providing habitat for pollinators. It's a really great opportunity to have this area be double duty, you know, and produce cleaner air and improve pollinators. While walking around, there are seven information panels providing facts and fun in an interactive way. There's a lot to learn here. If you're into teaching your kids about science and geography, I mean, you can get all of it here at the park. I capped ones. Oh, yeah. So there's yeah, definitely yeah. larva in there. Mm -hmm. You will learn how the butterflies and bees in this field are responsible for a lot of the food you eat every day. This is our things you can do at home to sort of replicate the efforts that we've done here. So easy things that people can do by providing shelter, food, water, and sustainable efforts. When you're done walking around the trail, the staff hopes you will go home and make some small changes that make a big difference. We want to encourage people that they can help, you know, they can help with small conservation actions at home. You're encouraged to come back to the park and walk the trail often because these species will change with the seasons. Reporting here in Warren County, meteorologist Ashley Smith, Fox 19. All right. So let me just switch my screen back to our presentation. The situation in Tonga oh, remains oh. unclear tonight with the Pacific Nation. In just a moment, I do apologize. Apparently, it kept going. Okay. So that was a great way to get information, you know, kind of out to, to the community at large. Um, but we also wanted to, to keep, you know, contributing to what 
the community what was learning about the trail. Um, so we, we did a virtual ribbon cutting because of COVID-19. Um, so in here, and Shannon, this gentleman's actual title. <laughs> ah, okay. So this is Jeff Blazy. He is the president um, of the Warren County Park Commission, the commissioners. Thank you. So this was just a very short video that we did in order to do a virtual opening of the array. All right, hi, my name is Jeff Blazy. I'm the per, uh, current president of Warren County Park District. And I wanna welcome you to the Armco Park Solar Array and Pollinator Habitat. Welcome to our new Solar Pollinator Habitat Discovery Trail. I'm naturalist Shannon, and today with me we have Melissa Prophet from Warren County Soil and Water Conservation District and our Ohio Certified Volunteer Naturalist, Diana Keneally. These two ladies were imperative to getting this project off the ground, and we are excited to officially open the trail. Come on out to the Warren County Park here at Armco Park and uh, enjoy our solar array and our pollinator habitat. So come out to the new Solar Pollinator Habitat Discovery Trail today and see what pollinators you can see flying around. The trail is open during park hours every day, dawn to dusk. All right, so after that video, we were like, you know, we could put this video on all of our different social medias. We could we could share those um, to try to increase the reach of those videos. And so then we were like, well, why not make more? So we went ahead and created a whole education video series. Um, we did a, a more in-depth walkthrough. Um, we talked about the plants. We talked about the, the solar power. Um, we talked about the monarch butterflies. Sort of did a video for each of our learning lessons um, that we were then able to put out to the community um, so that they could kind of get a better understanding of what they might see when they go out to the park um, in an unguided fashion. So all of these videos are also housed on the website for the Friends of the Warren County Park District. And then we still wanted to get real people right on the ground there. Um, and so part of this effort also involved volunteers um, that would help to come out and take care of the, this habitat. Um, so Shannon, do you want to talk a little bit about the, the Project Wingspan edition? Sure. So a couple of years ago, prior to COVID, prior to us applying for the grant, prior to the solar panels, I had attended a Project Wingspan um, conference with one of our other commissioners. Uh, and we got a notice in the mail that they had decided that we were a great candidate for some of their native plant plugs and native seeds. So it worked out really well because part of the process for establishing this native habitat involves trying to reclaim that area over a, a number of years, right? Because you're always gonna have invasives from other areas popping in. You've got the seed bed down there. Um, once you disturb the land, stuff starts to pop up that you don't want. So it's not just you plant it once and it's fantastic. I wish that's how it was. That's probably been our biggest challenge of this whole thing is trying to, to keep the invasive from taking over. But the project wingspan thing was great because part of that plan means removing the invasives that we do see pop up and replacing them with stuff that we want. And so this was an available uh, resource for us to use. And we tried to get families and scout troops and friends of the park district volunteers to do that. And it, the, it, the amount of people who wanted to help was amazing because as Melissa mentioned, people were wanting to get outside. Being at the park was one of the things that we were encouraged to do, especially during the lockdown period early on. So our park um, attendance has gone through the roof over the last couple of years people are kind of rediscovering what's available in their backyard. And this is one of those opportunities for them. So what you can't see on the left-hand side, that kind of orange square there, when I took that picture, 
directly behind me was a giant truck filled with water. So I had a sign up genius um, where people could go and say, I would be willing to bring my family out and water these plants on Tuesday, you know, May 1st. And they would sign up and go out there and use the water from the water truck and fill it up and um, enjoy the space with their families. And we did that for a period of about three months until those plants were established. And at this point in time, we do have quite a few of them that actually took, which was sort of nice. Um, and it, it was nice to bring in uh, the available people from the neighborhoods around and, and different scout troops and everything uh, to give us a hand with that. And we also, during that one planting project on the right-hand side, we used some of the seedlings from the Warren County Soil and Water Conservation District tree sale which I know you guys are doing that now. I know conservation districts around the country are probably doing the same, but this was an area where we were able to use um, kind of an in-kind donation and promote what was going on in our local soil and water conservation district too. So people know that that's a resource that they can go to. And it was just nice to have people together out doing the, these projects. <laughs> and then of course, in 2021, we did have a little bit more, um, a, a ability to host in-person programs. Again, with that being outdoors. Um, so we did do a few of these programs um, over the course of last summer. Um, what you're seeing here is that um, the, the picture of the group of kids there, we did a future conservationist day camp. Um, this was something that the Warren County Soil and Water Conservation District did, um, where we would go each day, we would go to a different park. Um, and being, we actually ended um, our, our week at Armco Park um, because there, this is such a great resource. Um, and you can see Shannon was able to, to take the kids through the Discovery Trail. They were able to look at the interactives. They were able to look for pollinators, you know, that were that were flying around. They were able to, to see the, the bee larva. And Shannon was able to bring some of her monarch caterpillars. So you can see on the, the little girl's arm there, she's got a caterpillar there and they could get this up close look. Um, we also did some scout programs out there. Um, our education assistant with uh, Warren County SWCD is also a beekeeper too. Um, so she did a beekeeping and pollinator program for a group of scouts. Um, and what's interesting is that that scout, um, one of the, the girls in that scout went on to do a, a badge service project um, where she was installing pollinator gardens and also collecting um, milkweed. And I know that, that Shannon worked with that scout a lot. So, you know, it was just kind of a springboard for more conservation projects, which is really cool to me. And that's um, and then one example of it. Like we've had, right. <laughs> you know, I've, I've taught classes for um, retirees at Miami University. And I mentioned this project during that one of those classes and somebody approached me after the class and said, this is so cool. I'm working to put in solar panels on my property. Do you think this is something I could do in my yard? And I was like, yes, absolutely. This is what we want, right? We want people to be able to take an experience like this where they see something on a grand scale, but be able to take a picture of that in their mind and scale it down to something that they can do in their own yard and share that with everybody else. So as Melissa mentioned, this is a very, it's a good springboard because you know, we've got the kids, the scouts, we've got retirees, we've got all kinds of folks who are visiting this, getting little seeds planted and then going home and being, being conservationists themselves, which is exciting. Absolutely. And in that group are educators as well. Um, so the, the picture kind of in the, the bottom left, I think, to what you guys are looking at. Um, you, you see, we did a project wild workshop um, that was part of our grant. And we did that in July this past summer. Um, and so we were able to, to look at curriculum from the, the project wild curriculum and look at, OK, how do we look at the, the lessons that have to do with sustainable energy? Um, and pollinators and what that picture is showing is actually the Monarch Marathon. Um, if any of you are familiar with the Project Wild, there's a really, really fun lesson where you, you have your students go through basically the generational migration of the monarchs. Um, and so that's what these teachers are doing here. And so it's great because now these teachers are learning about these resources as well. And now they're aware of areas that they can bring their students um, for field trips or to encourage families to then bring their students to. One of the contributions so, that we had from the Friends of the Park District was they provided us um, funding to make a checkout box. So teachers, scout troops, um, homeschoolers, 
anybody really who's interested can go to the park office and check out a Rubbermaid tub that inside of it has butterfly nets and um, wildflower identification guides and bee ID guides and butterfly ID guides and a couple of the different project wild lessons that Melissa mentioned. We have all of the resources in there. So it's all ready to go and organized and they can check that out. And it's, it's a kit that works with 30 kids at a time. Um, enough supplies for everybody to, to use something, magnifying glasses. I mean, there's all kinds of great stuff in there. So it's another way that we're trying to kind of make it easy for people to utilize the resource. And we, we had a lot of fun doing it too, I think. You know, um, I, I think my favorite thing of this project was just how many partners that we were able to work with. Um, I always think that I'm very, very lucky here in Warren County because I have a great working relationship with our park district. You know, um, there's a lot of different organizations that we can partner with and we all just have the, this, you know, you know, go get it attitude and we can, we can work together to expand our reach over and over again. Um, and so we're very excited that we got to share this with you guys today. Um, and now you've been hearing us talk for a while and we would like to go ahead and open it up for questions. All right, great. Thank you so much, Shannon and Melissa. You definitely have turned this program, uh, you know, when we were looking at the title of this presentation and thinking it was Solar Pollinator Habitat Discovery Trail, you've definitely turned it into more than just either solar or pollinator habitat or a trail. So congratulations on getting such a, a great project underway. Uh, so I'd like to remind everybody uh, now, if you have questions for Melissa and Shannon, please put those in the chat box and I'll read them out loud so that we can make sure to get them for the recording. So we have a few already. So would you two be willing to share more information about the educational element grant, um, sort of the proposal and the application process and the program that you're applying to and the budget for districts that may wish to pursue something similar? Of course. So ours was through the Ohio Environmental Protection Agency, and I'm sure that, that your various states have something similar. But we can definitely put that out in a follow-up email if you want um, some specifics there. Yeah, so the working budget for this, it came in. The working budget for this is, um, it, it was about 13,000 total. Um, you know, about uh, just under $9,000 is what was invested into the, the actual production design work of the, the signs themselves and those interactives. Um, and then the rest of that was actually the in-kind donations that were matched. Um, so, you know, it really with projects like this, I think that you can work within what your resources are. You know what I mean? We were, we were fortunate that we got this grant, so we had that budget to work with. But we actually came in, you know what I mean, under budget a little bit um, because we were able to do what we needed to do. And through just the, the amazing support of other outside partners that kind of came on and weren't even necessarily part of the grant, but just found out about the project and got excited to be involved. Um, you know, I think that's how you accomplish uh, projects of this scale is by getting multiple stakeholders together like that. Um, so our graduate student um, is the one who actually wrote the um, the grant itself. So I will say, you know, work with your local students. They are invaluable. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you for that, Melissa. And I, um, we have some other questions about specifics of the solar panels and things like that. But before we deviate off this topic of, of sort of funding and partnerships, I would like to follow up a little bit on that. Uh, because many of our districts, um, some have a lot of experience in the partnership space and applying for grants already, and some do not. So um, I'm curious if, if both of you, especially, you know, with this great relationship that you have with uh, the Parks Department and the SWC, if you have some recommendations for districts that may be starting out in the partnership space or maybe aren't certain how to pursue some of these relationships that you've been really successful with. So, you know, what I would say is, you know, well, when you think about if you're going after a grant, a lot of grant criteria look at how many partners are you bringing into the project. Um, the Ohio EPA who we award, you know, awarded us this grant, they actually do grant writing workshops. So for organizations that have never gone out and written a grant, I highly suggest looking for a, a workshop to kind of go, you know, go through the, the ABCs of what they're looking for in that grant. 
when it comes to kind of establishing relationships, I mean, you know, I'll kind of give my take and then Shannon j- jump in here as you want. But for me, it's about meeting the people who work at the agencies. I mean, I will say, you know, prior to, to me doing my first program at the Park District with Shannon, I hadn't done a lot with the Park District. Um, and so I think the personal relationships that you forge in those agencies, you find who you work well with, you find people, you know what I mean, that, that are complementing on the programs that you're doing. And, you know, I, I don't know how often it's kind of seen as, um, uh, not rivalry, but almost, you know, like, oh, we, we are all doing programs, so we don't want to step on toes and we don't want to take audience away, but it's all the same audience. You know, I mean, Shannon and I are, are, are often doing programs together. I'll go present at her event. She comes and presents at mine. And it's because we're all in this together and there's enough environmental education to put out there. Um, so there's not a, you know, it's very motivated. Same with our extension offices. And um, we've got a great educator in um, our Warren County Extension office named Laura. And, you know, her and I and Shannon and some of our city um, educators, like um, there is a lady that works with City of Lebanon, which is where our offices are located. We get together informally and meet and we talk about, hey, what programs are you doing this year? Oh, we're doing a similar program. Where can we work together? Um, and so kind of meeting on that ground, I think is really important. And it snowballs too, because once you have a connection with one of those organizations, then when you're talking about a topic, Melissa might say, oh, I know somebody, you know, like my, my assistant here is a beekeeper. I bet she would be really great at doing this particular thing for you. And that has happened again and again and again with the projects that I've done and the, um, the connections that I've made within the community where, you know, it, it really does just sort of snowball from a small little thing. And I think Melissa's right. The starting point is just meeting. I mean, you just need one, right? You just need one energetic person. And then it just sort of explodes from there. Excellent. Those are great tips. Thank you both very much for that. Um, and I just want to, uh, while I have the floor, I just want to make one quick plug for any districts that may be on this call that are interested in our urban agriculture conservation grants. Just a reminder, your applications are due January 31st. And I'll link an info session that we did do about the grant. So as Melissa and Shannon mentioned, it's great to, to reach out to the people that manage those grants and ask your questions and make sure that you're, you're hitting all the evaluation criteria. So I'll link that information session for those that have not yet had an opportunity to watch that webinar. All right, so now let's get into the specifics of uh, some of the signs and the pollen uh, solar panels themselves. So we had a question about how high the, the solar panels are off the ground. Uh, this individual had talked to solar companies on occasion and vegetation height was a limiting factor for anything uh, that they were looking at. Um, and they wanted species under 24 inches, but it looks like mm -hmm. your panels might be a little bit higher. So if you don't mind they are. sharing some information about that. Yep, so originally our panels were going to be, I think, 24 inches off the ground. And that was severely limiting to the species that we could put under there. Um, when we first met with the Ohio Pollinator Habitat Initiative biologists, they said, is there any way you can make those 48 inches high? And we went back to um, Rossmill Energy and asked them if that was a possibility. And they graciously said yes. So they took money out of their own budget and put that towards it. So we didn't pay anything the park didn't pay for this at all. Um, it was through through other organizations that contributed to it, but they took they took that on themselves in order to help this process along. But I have spoken with people after the fact who who are doing similar things just with shorter species um, that are native to that area. So it can be done with the shorter panels. It just means that you have um, less variety to choose from that would work there. So the higher it is, the more options that you have. And if you're able to raise them, great. If not, though, don't discount the idea because it can be done, just not with as much variety. Great, thank you. And uh, so that question was from Leslie Cooper and she has another question about um, the materials that you use to print the signs and how you were able to, to create something that was both um, unlikely to, to fade, for example, but also be able to handle some of the lifting up and fingertips and, and uh, things like that. Yeah, so this was an area where I didn't have any expertise except 
from being a parent and taking my own kids to places and seeing signs that had been weathered and you can't read them anymore, or they're cracked or whatever. So we knew that this was an object that we'd have to look at going in, right? It was gonna be something that we needed. So when we worked with, uh, we hired a graphic designer to do the design work for us. And she had some connections in the printing world and they were able to give us some specifics that would work for our area. And remember, this is in the middle of a solar field. So we're talking about an area that is getting sun on it, feeding on there all summer long and all winter long. And of course here in Ohio, we do have the extremes. So the materials that we use do have to withstand that. And they've been in for two years now and so far so good. I don't know, we'll see. But they did tell us that the, the sign printing company um, told us that they picked something to print on. It's like a, a laminated, um, like acrylic sort of material. And it's held up so, so far so good. And you also want to take into consideration when you think about the interactive component of the science. Um, before I came to the soil and water world, I came from the children's museum world. And it's amazing how destructive just daily wear, you know, not because they're trying to, to be, you know, hard on the signs, but just, you know, if you have anything that moves, you, you want to just keep an eye on that, you know, um, our, the, the flip signs seem to be maintaining really well. Um, but, you know, there, you know, we, we opted to not add, you know, kind of bigger um, interactives or things, you know, that might have more movable parts because things like that aren't necessarily going to have a long-term lifespan just because of the daily wear and tear that, that people exhibit on it when they use them. So you do want to think about that when you think about if you want to create interactive signage, you know, how, what is that interactive going to look like to be able to stand up to use? Excellent. Thank you for that, Melissa um, and Shannon. Um, and so something else. Uh, first off, I want to remind everybody we have a couple more minutes, time for a few more questions. So if you do have more, please put those in the chat box. Um, but I do have one additional question for all of you as well, um, and especially with both your education backgrounds. Um, so you mentioned a little bit about the Project WILD uh, curriculum, uh, but I'm curious if you could share a little bit more about that. Uh, I know it's some something that some districts have used within their urban ag grants um, and through other avenues, but I don't think it's something that um, uh, many people are as familiar with. So if you wouldn't mind sharing a little bit more about what that is and, and how you might be able to connect with it. Sure, absolutely. So Project Wild, it's a national curriculum um, that the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies puts out. Um, and typically every state has a state coordinator of Project Wild. Um, here in Ohio, our state coordinator, her name is Jen Dennison. Um, and, and she's phenomenal. And you know, I'm sure that the state coordinators are there basically as the person to get trained in the curriculum. Um, so, you know, the curriculum, it kind of works in where they have facilitators. So myself, I am a trained facilitator. So I've gone through training in order to teach other educators and classroom teachers and informal educators how to use this curriculum in the classroom. Um, this curriculum, it is based, it is standard aligned. Um, so it does align to national standards. Um, and it's basically curriculum that engages with lots of different environmental and natural natural resource topics. So there's wildlife um, lessons, there are, you know, water quality lessons, there are lessons on plants and ecologies, there's lessons on um, careers in the, the natural resource fields. Um, so it's a, it's a great curriculum. And then as a facilitator, I can host workshops where um, other local teachers and educators can come learn about the curriculum. They then get the book um, that has all of the lessons in it. The book also will have copy pages for the student handout. So it's kind of a great, you know, here is a ready to go resource to bring into the classroom, to bring to your scout group, um, your homeschool group, you know, wherever you're, you're teaching. Um, and then you can also, you know, tweak those based on the region that you're in as well. Um, there is an online support system for their curriculum. So there's a lot of um, virtual digital resources as well. Um, and I think there's even more so after, you know, the last couple of years. So that's another benefit is that that's available online as well. Um, so if you are interested in learning more about Project WILD, um, you, can, you can just do a Google search of Project WILD. It will take you to the association's website. And then based on whatever state you are in, 
you can look up your state coordinator and that's the a great resource person to find out how you can get training in the Project WILD curriculum. All right, excellent. Thank you for that. Um, and I noticed Shannon, you uh, linked to more information in the chat box as well to the trail. So thank you for doing that. Um, so we have a question now from our colleague Cody, who works for the Resource Conservation District of Greater San Diego. And uh, they are working on providing site assessments to create actionable plans for farmers and ranchers to install pollinator habitat. So uh, they're curious what some of the most helpful parts of the plan you received from OPHI might be. Yeah, okay. So I can answer this one. I saw that and was jotting down some notes. So um, in our plan, it gave us the specific seed mix, including the scientific names, the growth height, the bloom times that we could expect. Um, so that was helpful because we ended up ordering our seeds directly from them, but we were given the option to order them from any resource that we wanted. So being able to, to know what we were asking for was very helpful and knowing what we would expect out of each of those plants. Um, it also laid out the planting techniques and the machinery that we would need. So because we work at the park district and we have a fantastic staff that is, you know, used to doing lots of things with, with heavy machinery, it was fine for us to be able to provide that equipment. However, not everybody might have those things available to them. So knowing what equipment um, would be helpful um, to have was one of the things. And then just that timeline of you know, they gave us, I think, three years out from planting time and what you're supposed to do on a monthly basis. And many of those months are do absolutely nothing. And I think just knowing that it was okay to not do anything was helpful. You know, they say with these um, native perennials, it's the first year they sleep, the second year they creep, the third year they leap. We were in year three last summer and it was finally like, wow. So knowing ahead of time that that's how it was going to play out and what we could expect to do and what we could expect to see over that progression of time was extremely helpful too. And then finally, they um, provided a follow-up service where they came out and looked at the site after it had been growing for a couple of years, helped us to identify some of the plants that we weren't sure about and say, oh yeah, this is a whatever, whatever, you don't want that here. This is gonna have to go on your, you know, your broadleaf spraying spectrum um, treatment plan or, oh, that's a really cool plant, definitely leave that there. So having that follow-up involved um, was very helpful too. Thank Excellent. you so much. Thank you, Shannon. That's, um, I think those are really helpful comments, especially from a, a landowner's perspective as they're thinking about how some of these new plants might be different than what they're accustomed to. So wait and see in some cases might be very adequate advice. So um, thank you for that. All right, so we are just about out of time and I'm not seeing any additional questions from our audience. So I'd like to thank you both again and offer you the opportunity to, um, uh, sorry, I did just see one other <laughs> comment here from Leslie Cooper. Uh, pheasants forever and quail forever are also have biologists across the country that are co-located in NRCS offices. And maybe um, there may be one close to, to many of uh, our attendees here if um, you're looking for additional on the ground technical assistance that may help with uh, habitat for, for um, quail and pheasants as well as others. Um, so yes, now I would like to finalize things <laughs> and um, offer each of you uh, just a, a, a closing response or any additional tips that you may have for our audience today. Uh, just that, yes, those are great agencies that she mentioned, and they are partners and part of the OPHI, which is the organization that helped with this project. So absolutely. I'm um, just, you know, thank you. It was, it's been a pleasure to be able to be on here, um, hear your guys' questions. And if you guys think of questions, you know, after this webinar, this is our contact information for Shannon and I. And both of us are always willing and eager to talk about this stuff till we're blue in the face. So reach out to <laughs> us if you think of something down the road. <laughs> And I hope that, you know, as we were trying to convey things to our park visitors, hopefully you too have picked something up that you can do in your own yard. Just the simplest thing, you know, I've had people come up and say, well, I live in an apartment, so I can't, and it's like, nope, you can get a pot of flowers that are native to your area. And I guarantee you're gonna see some activity on that pot of flowers. So take something away from it and hopefully you can, can learn something with it too. 
Excellent. Thank you both. And I'll definitely uh, be sending around your presentation as well as your contact information to everyone that's registered uh, today and the link to the YouTube when we get that up for uh, everyone to share with um, other audiences beyond this one. So thank you both again for a great presentation and thank you to everyone for joining us and we'll see you next month where uh, we will have yet again another urban and community conservation webinar. Thank you everyone. Take care. Good night. Bye.